The Golden Goose There was once a man who had three sons, the youngest of whom was called the Simpleton, and was despised, laughed at, and neglected. It happened one day that the eldest son wished to go into the forest to cut wood, and before he went, his mother gave him a delicious pancake and a flask of wine, that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst. When he got to the forest, a little old grey man met him, who said, Good day, young man. Could you give me a bit of cake out of your pocket, and let me have a drink of your wine? I am so hungry and thirsty. To which the young man replied, Give you my cake and my wine. I haven't got any. Take off and leave me alone. Then he began to chop down a tree. And before long, he made a wrong stroke, and the hatchet hit him in the arm, so that he had to go back home and get it bandaged. And he thought no more of the little old grey man. The very next day, the second son went into the wood, and the mother gave to him, as to the eldest, a delicious pancake and a flask of wine. The little old man met him as well, and in a friendly greeting said, Good day, young man. Could you possibly spare a bit of your pancake and let me have a small drink of your wine? If I give you some of mine, I will have that much less for myself. Earn your own bed and stop pestering me. And leaving the old man there, he went off. The punishment soon followed. As he chopped away at the tree, he hit himself in the leg so severely that he had to ask the help of strangers to carry him home. Then the youngest son, the simpleton, said, Father, let me go for once into the forest to cut wood. Your brothers have hurt themselves trying. How do you think that you, a simpleton, can manage it? But please, father, I must try. And he went on begging so long that the father said at last, Well, go on then. You will only learn by experience. The mother gave him a pancake made with water and baked in the ashes, and a flask of sour beer. When he reached the forest, the little old grey man met him and greeted him. Good day, young man. Give me a bit of your cake and a drink from your flask. I am so hungry and thirsty. But I have only a flour and water pancake and sour beer. If that is good enough for you, let us sit down together and eat. Then they sat down, and when the simpleton took out his flour and water cake, it became a rich pancake, and his sour beer became good wine. When they had finished eating and drinking, the old man said, As you have such a kind heart, and share what you have so willingly, I will bring you good luck. You see that tree over there? Cut it down, and at its roots you will find something quite useful. And he left. The simpleton went there, chopped away at the tree, and when it fell, he saw, sitting among the roots, a goose with feathers of pure gold. He lifted it out and took it with him to an inn, where he intended to stay the night. The landlord had three daughters, who, when they saw the goose, were curious to know what wonderful kind of bird it was, and longed for one of its golden feathers. The eldest thought, Hmm, I will wait for a good opportunity, and then I will pull out one of its feathers for myself. And so, when the simpleton was gone out, she grabbed the goose by its wing. But as soon as she had touched it, her hand was stuck, and she could not pull it away. Soon after came the second sister, with the same idea of plucking out one of the golden feathers for herself. But as soon as she touched her older sister, 
She too was stuck. Finally came the third sister with the same intention, but the others screamed out, Stay away! For heaven's sake, stay away! But she thought, Hey, they just want to take more feathers for themselves. <laughs> Why should I not get my share? And then she continued towards them. But when she reached her sisters, she too was stuck. And so they stayed all night. The next morning, the simpleton took the goose under his arm and went away, not noticing the three girls who were stuck to it. The three had to run after him, left or right, whichever way his legs carried him. When they were crossing a field, they met the parson, who when he saw them said, Shame on you girls, running after a young fellow through the fields like this. And then he grabbed hold of the youngest sister to drag her away. And then he too was obliged to run after them. Soon after, the sexton came that way. And seeing the respected parson following at the heels of the three girls, he called out, Hello, your reverence. Where are you going in such a hurry? Have you forgotten that we have another christening today? And he grabbed the parson's gown. But no sooner had he touched him, than he too was obliged to follow on. As the five tramped on one after another, two peasants with their hoes came up from the fields, and the parson cried out to them to come and set him and the sexton free. But no sooner had they touched the sexton, than they had to follow too. And now there were seven following the simpleton and the goose. Later that day they came to a town where a king reigned, who had an only daughter who was so serious that no one could make her laugh. And the king had made it known that whoever could make her laugh should have her in marriage. The simpleton, when he'd heard this, went with his goose and his hangers on into the presence of the king's daughter. And as soon as she saw the seven people following always, one after the other, she burst out laughing, and it seemed as if she would never stop. And so the simpleton earned a right to her as his bride. But the king did not like him for a son-in-law, and made all kinds of objections, and said he must first bring a man who could drink up a whole cellar of wine. The simpleton thought that the little grey man would be able to help him, and went out into the forest, and there, on the very spot where he felled the tree, he saw a man sitting, looking very sad. The simpleton asked him what was the matter, and he answered, I have a great thirst which I cannot quench. Cold water does not agree with me. I have indeed drunk up a whole cask of wine. But what good is a drop like that? I can help you. Come with me, and you shall have enough. He took him straight to the king's cellar. And the man sat himself down before the big vats, and drank and drank. And before a day was over, he had drunk up the whole cellar full. The simpleton again asked for his bride. But the king was annoyed that a wretched fellow, called the simpleton by everybody, should carry off his daughter. And so he made new conditions. This time he must bring a man who could eat up a whole mountain of bread. The simpleton did not hesitate, but ran off quickly to the forest. And there in the same place sat a man who had fastened a strap around his body, making a very sad face and saying, I have eaten a whole big house full of rolls, but what is the use of that when one is as hungry as I am? My stomach feels quite empty, and I must strap myself together so I may not die of hunger. Get up quickly and come along with me, then you shall have enough to eat. He led him straight to the king's courtyard where all the flour in the kingdom had been collected 
and baked into a mountain of bread. The man from the forest settled himself down before it and began to eat. In one day the whole mountain had disappeared. Then the simpleton asked for his bride the third time. The king, however, found one more excuse, and said that he must have a ship that should be able to sail on land or on water. As soon as you come sailing along with it, you shall have my daughter for your wife. The simpleton went straight to the forest, and there sat the little old gray man with whom he had shared his cake, and he said, I have eaten for you, and I have drunk for you. I will also give you the ship, and all because you were kind to me at the first. Then he gave him the ship that could sail on land and water, and when the king saw it, he knew he could no longer withhold his daughter. The marriage took place immediately, and at the death of the king, the simpleton possessed the kingdom, and lived long and happy with his wife. The end. THE FOX AND THE CAT It happened that the cat met the fox in a forest, and as she thought to herself, He is clever and full of experience, and much esteemed in the world. She spoke to him in a friendly way. Good day, dear Mr. Fox. How are you? How is all with you? How are you getting through this season? The fox, full of all kinds of arrogance, looked at the cat from head to foot, and for a long time did not know whether he would give an answer or not. At last he said, Oh, you wretched beard cleaner! You bipolar fool! You hungry mouse eater! What can you be thinking of? Do you venture to ask me how I'm getting on? What have you learnt? How many tricks do you know? But one, replied the cat modestly. What trick is that, then? asked the fox. When the hounds are following me, I can spring into a tree and save myself. Is that all? I am master of a hundred tricks, and have into the bargain a sack full of cunning. You make me sorry for you. Come with me. I will teach you how people get away from the hounds. Just then came a hunter with four dogs. The cat sprang nimbly up a tree and sat down at the top of it, where their branches and foliage quite concealed her. Open your sack, Mr. Fox! Open your sack! cried the cat to him. But the dogs had already seized him and were holding him fast. Ah, oh, Mr. Fox, you with your hundred tricks are left in a loop. Had you been able to climb like me, you would not have lost your life. The end. The Young Giant A long time ago, our countryman had a son who was as small as a thumb and did not become any bigger and during several years he did not grow one hair's breadth. Once, when the father was going out to plow, the little one said, Father, may I go out with you? Go out with me? Why, no, no, stay here. You will be of no use out there. Besides, you might get lost. Then Thumbling began to cry, and for the sake of peace, his father put him in his pocket and took him out with him. When he was outside in the field, he took him out again and set him in a freshly cut furrow. While he was there, a great giant came over the hill. Do you see that great monster? said the father, for he wanted to frighten the little fellow to make him good. He is coming to fetch you! The giant, however, had scarcely taken two steps with his long legs before he was in the furrow. 
He took up little Thumbling carefully with his two fingers, examined him, and without saying one word, went away with him. His father stood by, but could not utter a sound for terror, and he thought nothing else but that his child was lost, and that as long as he lived, he should never set eyes on him again. The giant, however, carried him home, fed him, and Thumbling grew and became tall and strong after the manner of giants. When two years had passed, the old giant took him into the forest, wanted to try him, and said, Pull up a stick for yourself. Then the boy was already so strong that he tore up a young tree out of the earth by the roots. But the giant thought, We must do better than that, took him back again and fed him for another two years. When he tried him, his strength had increased so much that he could tear an old tree out of the ground. But that was not still enough for the giant. So he again took him home for two years and fed him. And when he then went with him into the forest and said, Now just tear up a proper stick for me. The boy tore up the strongest oak tree from the earth, so that it split, and that that was a mere trifle for him. Now that will do. That is perfect. And took him back to the field from whence he had brought him. His father was there following the plow. The young giant went up to him and said, Does my father see what a fine man his son has grown into? The father was alarmed and said, No, you are not my son. I don't want you. Leave me alone. Truly, I am your son. Allow me to do your work. I can plow as well as you, maybe even better. No, no, you are not my son, and you can't plow. Now go away, leave me alone. However, as he was afraid of this great man, he left hold of the plow, stepped back, and stood at one side of the piece of land. Then the youth took the plow, and just pressed it with one hand, but his grasp was so strong the plow went deep into the earth. The farmer could not bear to see that, and called to him, If you are determined to plow, you must not press so hard on it. That makes bad work. The youth, however, unharnessed the horses, and drew the plow himself, saying, Just go home, father and bid my mother make ready a large dish of food, and in the meantime I will go over the field. Then the farmer went home and ordered his wife to prepare the food. But the youth plowed the field, which was two acres large, quite alone, and then he harnessed himself to the harrow and harrowed the whole of the land using two harrows at once. When he had done it, he went into the forest and pulled up two oak trees, laid them across his shoulders, and hung one harrow on them behind and one in front, and also one horse behind and one in front, and carried all as if it had been a bundle of straw to his parents' house. When he entered the yard, his mother did not recognize him and asked, who is that horrible tall man? That horrible tall man is our son. No, no, no. That cannot be our son. We never had such a tall one. Ours was such a little thing. She called to him. Go away. We do not want you. The youth was silent, but led his horse to the stable, gave them oats and hay and all they wanted. When he had done this, he went into the parlor, sat down on the bench, and said, Mother, I'm absolutely famished. I should like something to eat. Will it soon be ready? Yes, coming right up. And brought in two immense dishes full of food, which would have been enough to satisfy herself and her husband for a week. 
The youth, however, ate the whole of it himself, and asked if she had nothing more to set before him. No, that is all we have. But that was only a taste. I must have more. She did not dare to oppose him, and went and put a huge cauldron full of food on the fire, and when it was ready, carried it in. Oh, look, mother has brought some crumbs, he said, and ate all there was, but this was still not sufficient to appease his hunger. Then he said, Father, I see very well that I shall never get enough food here. If you can find me an iron staff which is strong, which I cannot break against my knees, I will leave and go into the world. The farmer was glad, put his two horses in his cart, and fetched from the smith a staff so large and thick that the two horses could only just bring it away. The youth laid it across his knees and snapped. He broke it in two in the middle like a beanstick and threw it away. The father then harnessed four horses and brought a bar which was so long and thick that the four horses could barely just drag it. The son snapped this also in between his knees and threw it away and said, Father, this can be of no use to me. You must harness more horses and bring a stronger staff. So the father harnessed eight horses and brought one which was so long and thick that the eight horses could just only carry it. When the son took it in his hand, he broke a bit from the top of it also and said, Father, I see that you will not be able to produce the staff that I cannot break, so I will stay here no longer and leave you be. So he went away and gave out that he was a smith's apprentice. He arrived at a village wherein lived a smith who was a greedy fellow, who never did a kindness to anyone, but wanted everything for himself. The youth went into the smithy to him and asked if he needed a journeyman. Why, yes, in fact I do. And looked at him and thought, that is a strong fellow who will strike out well and earn his bread. So he asked, How much wages do you want? I don't want any at all. Only every fortnight, when the other gentlemen are paid, I will give you two blows, and you must bear them. The miser was heartily satisfied, and thought he would thus save much money. Next morning, the strange journeyman was to begin to work, but when the master brought the glowing bar, and the youth struck his first blow, the iron flew asunder, and the anvil sank so deep into the earth that there was no bringing it out again. Then the miser grew angry and said, You make me very angry, very angry indeed. I cannot use you. You strike too far, too powerful. What must I pay you now to get rid of you? I will only give you a little blow, not much. And he raised his foot and gave him such a kick that he flew away over four loads of hay. Then he sought out the thickest iron bar in the smithy for himself, took it as a stick in his hand and went onwards. When he had walked for some time, he came to a small farm and asked the bailiff if he did not require a head servant. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I can make use of you. You look like a strong fella. You can do something. Ah, uh, how much a year do you want as wages? Eh? He again replied that he wanted no wages at all, but that every year he would give him three blows which he must bear. Then the bailiff was satisfied, for he too was a covetous fellow. Next morning all the servants were to go into the wood, and the others were already up, but the head servant was still in bed. Then one of them called to him, It's time to get up. We're going into the woods, and you must come with us. What? 
You wake me up to tell me that? Why, you just go yourself. I'll be back again before any of you anyways. Leave me be. Then the others went to the bailiff and told him that the headman was still lying in bed and would not go into the wood with them. The bailiff said they were to awake him again and tell him to harness the horses. The headman, however, said as before, Just go there. Go by yourself and leave me alone. I'll be back before you anyways. And then he stayed in bed two hours longer. At length he rose from the feathers, but first he got himself two bushels of peas from the log, made himself some broth with them, ate it at his leisure, and when that was done, went and harnessed the horses, and drove into the wood. Not far from the wood was a ravine through which he had to pass, so he first drove the horses on, then stopped them, and went behind the cart, took trees and brushwood, and made a great barricade so that no horse could get through. When he was entering the wood, the others were just driving out of it with their loaded carts to go home. Then he said to them, Drive on! I will still get home before you do. He did not drive far into the wood, but at once tore two of the very largest trees of all out of the earth, threw them on his cart, and turned round. When he came to the barricade, the others were still standing there, not able to get through. Don't you see, you fool, that if you had stayed with me, you would have got home just as quickly, and you could have stayed in bed another hour. He now wanted to drive on, but his horses could not work their way through. So he unharnessed them, laid them at the top of the cart, took the shafts in his own hands and drew it over. And he did this just as easily as if it had been laden with feathers. When he was over, he said to the others, There, you see, I have got over quicker than you. And drove on and the others had to stay where they were. In the yard, however, he took a tree in his hand, showed it to the bailiff, and said, Now look here! Isn't that a fine bundle of wood? Then the bailiff said to his wife, Eh, the servant is a good one. Even if he does sleep long, he still gets home before the others. So he served the bailiff a year, and when that was over, and the other servants were getting their wages, he said it was time for him to have his too. The bailiff, however, was afraid of the blows which he was to receive, and earnestly entreated him to excuse him from having them, for rather than that, he himself would be head servant, and the youth should be bailiff. No, I will not be bailiff, I am head servant and will remain so, but I will administer that which we agreed on." The bailiff was willing to give him whatsoever he demanded, but it was of no use. The head servant said no to everything. Then the bailiff did not know what to do, and begged for a fortnight's delay, for he wanted to find some way to escape. The head servant consented to this delay. The bailiff summoned all his clerks together, and they were there to think the matter over and give him advice. The clerks pondered for a long time, and at last they said that no one was sure of his life with the head servant, for he could kill a man as easily as a midget, and that the bailiff ought to make him get into the well and clean it. And when he was down below, they would roll up one of the millstones which was lying there, and throw it on his head, and then he would never return to daylight. The advice pleased the bailiff, and the head servant was quite willing to go down the well. When he was standing down below at the bottom, they rolled down the largest millstone, and thought they had broken his skull, but he cried, Chase away those hens from the well! 
They are scratching in the sand up there and throwing the grains into my eyes so that I can't see. So the bailiff cried, Shh, shh, and pretended to frighten the hens away. When the head servant had finished his work, he climbed up and said, Just look what a beautiful necktie I have on. And behold, it was the millstone, which he was wearing round his neck. The head servant now wanted to take his reward, but the bailiff again begged for a fortnight's delay. The clerks met together and advised him to send the head servant to the haunted mill to grind corn by night, for from thence as yet no man had ever returned in the morning alive. This proposal pleased the bailiff. He called the head servant that very evening and ordered him to take eight bushels of corn to the mill and grind it that night, for it was wanted. So the head servant went to the law and put two bushels in his right pocket and two in his left and took four in a wallet, half on his back and half on his breast and thus laden went to the haunted mill. The miller told him that he could grind there very well by day but not by night for the mill was haunted and that up to the present time Whosoever had gone into it at night had been found in the morning lying dead inside. I will manage it. Just you go away to bed. Then he went into the mill and poured out the corn. About eleven o'clock he went into the miller's room and sat down on the bench. When he had sat there a while, a door suddenly opened and a large table came in, and on the table wine and roasted meats placed themselves, and much good food besides, but everything came of itself, for no one was there to carry it. After this the chairs pushed themselves up, but no one came, until all at once he beheld fingers, which handled knives and forks, and laid food on the plates, but with this exception he saw nothing. As he was hungry and saw the food, he too placed himself at the table, ate with those who were eating and enjoyed it. When he had had enough and the others also had quite emptied their dishes, he distinctly heard all the candles being suddenly snuffed out. And as it was now pitch dark, he felt something like a box on his ear. I say, if anything of that kind comes again, I shall strike out and return. And when he had received a second box on the air, he too struck out. And so it continued the whole night. He took nothing without returning it, but repaid everything with goodness, and did not lay about him in vain. At daybreak, however, everything ceased. When the miller had got up, he wanted to look after him, and wondered if he were still alive. Then the youth said, I have eaten my fill, have received some boxes on the air, but I have given some in return. The miller rejoiced, and said that the mill was now released from the spell, and wanted to give him some money as a reward. But he said, Money? I will not have. I have enough of it. So he took his meal on his back and went home and told the bailiff that he had done what he had been told to do and would now have the reward agreed on. When the bailiff heard that, he was seriously alarmed and quite beside himself. He walked backwards and forwards in the room and drops of perspiration ran down his forehead. Then he opened the window to get some fresh air, but before he was aware, the head servant had given him such a kick that he flew through the window out into the air, and so far away that no one ever saw him again. Then the head servant said to the bailiff's wife, If your husband does not come back, then you must take the other blow. 
No, no, please, I cannot bear it. And opened the other window because drops of perspiration were running down her forehead. Then he gave her such a kick that she too <coughs> flew out. And as she was lighter, she went much higher than her husband. Wife, wife, do come here. But she replied, No, you come to me. I cannot come to you. They hovered about in the air and could not get to each other. And whether they are still hovering about or not, I do not know. But the young giant took up his iron bar and went on his way. The end.